I'm sure a lot of people have heard about Python and you know you've probably been confused about what it is and exactly what you can use Python for as a data scientist. So today we're going to be looking at what you can use um, a real life application of Python basically and then um, we'll get into more interesting stuff within the session. Okay, so before we get started, I'd like to meet everybody on the call. So I want you to tell me your name and where you're joining us from. Okay, in the chat, please drop your name and where you are joining us from. My name is Damla, I'm joining from Nigeria and I'd like to meet everybody on the call. So please tell me your name and of course, where you are joining us from. I'll be waiting for people to drop, you know, the updates for me in the chat. Your name and where you're joining, of course, where you're joining us from. Okay, so, um, all right, for Lakemi from Lagos, you're welcome. Um, Uche from Lagos, welcome as well. Welcome, welcome. Asha from Abuja, <laughs> nice to meet you. Welcome. And David, Sadiq, Jerry, Okwayemi, it's nice to meet every one of you. Let's keep it going. Celestine from Canada, you're very much welcome. Yummy from Lagos, welcome. Um, Nikolai Pacheco, did I pronounce that correctly? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, welcome. Welcome to this session. Let's keep it going. And we promise to, like, it's going to be an amazing session, all right? You're going to be learning a lot from this session, okay? Like I said earlier, it's going to be a live demo of applying Python in real life, all right? But before I um before we get into the you know the coding session, if this is the first time you've been hearing about analytics, I want you to drop me one in the chat. If you have heard about analytics before, you've attended any of our sessions, I want you to drop a zero in the chat. If this is the first time you'll be um joining, drop a one. And if you've joined before, um please drop a zero. Welcome to everybody that, that are just joining. It's good to have you guys here. And um, we promise to, we promise that you're going to be learning a lot from this session, okay? So we have a lot to, you know, give out in this session. So welcome. And if you have um family and members that you, friends that you feel like would benefit a lot from this session, you probably want to send them the link, all right? But yeah, we're just get, going to get started. So for people that are, new i'm going to very quickly introduce who we are at Tenalytics and what we do all right so we are Tenalytics, and um we are tech uh that are very focused on helping people of the black community and people of the global community transition into tech we are um helping Africans and people of the black community learn premium tech skills and lowering the entry barrier into tech to ensure that regardless of your background, regardless of your um, yeah, educational background, whatever background you're from, you're able to get into tech with little to no hassle. Our service offerings are aimed at building capacity and also um, understanding across different tech career fields like um, data analytics, data science, data engineering, um, business analysis, HR analytics, cybersecurity, Chrome Master, and so on and so forth, right? And we are ensuring that everybody that, you know, joins our community are able to achieve everything that they've set out to achieve and also to achieve and also to um, make, make good sense of their career. Our facilitators are from top, are from top, you know, reputable organizations like Apple, like Microsoft, like McKinsey, like um, Coca-Cola, Sahara, Google, name it, and so on and so forth. We bring you, we always endeavor to bring you the best of the best, okay? And our courses are structured in a way that are extremely beginner friendly. When I say beginner friendly, like we start from what is this? That's our beginner friendly our courses are and they ensure that you get optimal value for every investment that you put into this so that is the analytics for you feel free to join us um to follow us on any of our social media platforms um uh, right 
Sorry, please give me a uh, Okay, so feel free to join us on any of our social media platform. All right, and um, yeah, let's let's have maximum fun, fun together. So you can follow us on Twitter at um, Analytics, on LinkedIn at Analytics, on what uh, <laughs> Instagram at Analytics, and you can check us out on social media Analytics that I hold. Okay, so that's about it. Um, meet the founders of Analytics, the people behind this great uh, environment of learning. We have Adiza Suleiman, who is the founder of Analytics. Um, is a data analytics expert. He's also a data science consultant across UK, across US, and so on and so forth. Um, Adiza is um, used to be a data analyst with Sahara Group. And he also moved on to, he worked with FITC as data analytics consultant. He's someone who has over a de decade of experience in the data analytics and management consulting. And he has worked in different sectors like sports, ed tech, energy, automobile, and so on and so forth. And Adesa personally has trained over 8,500 participants across different Take career skills. That is Adisa, Adisa Suleiman, our founder. And if you would like to connect with Adisa, you can find him on LinkedIn at Adisa Suleiman, as well as Twitter and um, Instagram. Then on the right hand side, we have Ifemina Ipro. Ifemina is the co founder of Analytics. He has worked as a data science consult contractor <clears throat> with um, across UK, across US, across Canada. He previously worked with business as a business data support lead in the post office in the UK. Also worked at um, as a data analytics manager with CISA UK. He worked at the post office um, um, in Teleflex, Ireland. He worked at DPD Ireland as a business intelligence developer. And he has experience cutting across data science, data engineering, cyber security, Power platform engineering and so on and so forth. And I, um, if you may not personally as um over a decade of years, de decade years of experience as well, cutting across multiple, multiple sectors. So if you would like to connect with um if you may not, you can find him on LinkedIn at if you may not, pro as well as um Twitter and Instagram. Now meet your host for today. This is me. I am Uluwa Damlola Jumobi, and I lead the training operations here at Analytics. I have over five years of experience in data analytics and data science, and I've worked on different IHEN projects um, alongside C-suite executives, cutting across NGOs and edtech and finance and technology. And I'm very passionate about helping people transition into tech. If you like to connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn at um, Uluwa Damlola Adumobi. Then um, with me today is, Ibrahim, Ibrahim. <laughs> okay. Ibrahim, Ibrahim is a senior data associate with us at Analytics, And he has over five years of experience as well in data science and has worked in various sectors such as FMCG, music, consulting, advanced research, and so on and so forth. And um, the extent of Ibrahim's work in this industry spanned data analysis and machine learning we are going to be learning from Ibrahim Ibrahim today. And like I said earlier, it's going to be an amazing session. So this is the point where you start to get out your pencil and your paper, ensure your Wi-Fi or internet is well connected because you don't even want to be thrown out of this meeting at all. You don't want to miss out on any, a single second from this meeting. All right, so if you like to connect with um, Ibrahim Ibrahim, you can find him on LinkedIn at Ibrahim Ibrahim. You know, it's double, double. But yeah, that, that's how it is. Okay, Um. so very quickly, I'm going to be introducing what we are doing here today. Number one, we're going to be having a practical live session on what coding with Python in real life. Then in real time, you see it's in real time. Then we're going to be talking about the pathway to becoming a data scientist and securing a job as a data scientist. Then we're also going to discuss the remote full-time um, 
full-time and tech reloc relocation opportunities that we have packaged you know we have looked we have done the research for you and then we have packaged it and i've come to tell you the way it is the way to go then we'll talk about the analytics broad internship program and then of course our special offer to you today so without any further ado i'm going to be calling up ibrahim ibrahim um for the practical aspect of the session hi ibrahim ibrahim hi everyone um my name is ibrahim ibrahim and um, welcome to the practical aspect of the session okay um um Dami, could you just keep your slides up? So um, I use that. OK. Oh, yeah. So um, in today's um, practical session, um, we are going to be handling a couple of, um, or trying to get to a couple of um, objectives done. Okay, we are going to start with um, getting started with Python and Google Colab. We are going to look at what is Python um, as a programming language. We are also going to look at, you know, where do we write Python codes basically. Um, we are going to look at a very popular example of an environment where we write Python code, which is Google Colab. The next thing we are going to do, given the opportunity, um, is um that's the next thing we are going to do explore basic concepts in programming right i'm going to take us through a couple of these concepts um introduction to um comments um data types um the different types of data types we have integer floats strings um we are also going to look at something called variable assignments, right? Um, and rules about variables. We are going to look at and um, what are the ways to write create variables and what are the ways to not create variables. Then we are going to take all this note because it's going to be a very um, short class. I don't want to overwhelm anybody you know, with uh, um, any advanced concept, but with just this little knowledge we are going to be sharing today, we are going to go ahead and you know create something that you know could be applicable in real life. You will see how just by learning about data types, learning about you know variables, you can use that small knowledge that you gain to create something that you know mimics a popular real life scenario. So what we are going to be doing in the real life application demo would not be far off from um from something you see in the real world. It's going to be very very close to processes you see in the real world. Okay, so um uh um. I see, I see a question about how can we get the recordings. The recordings will come in um, to be provided. Um, but um, as I'm saying, we are going to move on to the demo and that's what we call it a day in terms of the practical session, right? Applying everything we have learned about in you know, Python, Colab, programming, and you know, going on to create something, right? So right about now, I will go ahead and share uh, my screen, okay? Um, I need confirmation. Okay, I'm not sharing my screen. Great. So let me move on to um, um, where we, we are going to kickstart things from, right? So this is where we are going to kickstart uh, our journey from today's practical session. So everybody take a deep breath um, and um, let us all relax, right? So we will start off with Google Colab, right? What is Google Colab? Google Colab is an environment that is current, that is used to write codes, right? They are called integrated development environments. So what is integrated? What is development? What is environment? Let me explain what an IDE is to you. So basically, I'm going to come over here and I will if I do that, let me go ahead and explain an IDE. Um, when you want to write a document, a Word document, you use, you know, MS Word, right? Or you use Google Docs, okay? Um, you, you can go ahead and, you know, type in the chat what, um, um, editor you use for writing your documents, your projects, your write-ups, your articles. Most of us use either Google Docs or MS Word. For maybe a presentation slides, um, we, either, we could use PowerPoint or Google Slides, right? Um, and for a spreadsheet, we could use Excel, we could use um, Google Sheets. Now, if you observe every document type, 
has its own editor, right? Docu um, Word documents, MS Word, um, presentation, um, PowerPoint, um, spreadsheets, Excel, right? So it goes without saying that to get started with writing Python code, you probably need to use a special editor like the, like the ones I've just um, stated above, right? If 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 only some if something as simple as a word document requires an editor, what's more, you know, Python programming itself. So, and because programming is a bit more advanced than writing a letter or creating slides, because programming is a bit more advanced, the editor does not come alone. The editor comes, you know, with other tools that have been integrated with it, right? That have been packaged with it, right? And together they make up the environment. So that word environment, you see where it is coming from. It's coming from the fact. That the editor, what you use to write your Python code, does not stand alone. So that's where the environment comes in. Now, because this environment is to support you in the development of Python programming, right? It is called a development environment. And as such, the full name integrated development environment. We integrate several um, um, tools along with your editor to develop programming, and this makes up your environment. Right. So that is what an ID is. And Colab is an example of an IDE that is suited for data science. That is the optic to using Google Colab. It is quite suited for data science. You know, um, people like to brag about what kind type of IDE they use, what, what kind of environment they use, right? Some people say, ah, I like using Android still because I create applications. Some people say they like using VS Code because they create software. We data scientists, um, you potential data scientists, your own um, um, IDE, your colors is um. Google Colab, that is what to go, Google Colab, right? So to gain access to Google Colab, all you need is a Gmail, right? And all you need to do is go to google.com right about now and search Google Colab, search Google Colab, Google Colab, Google Collaboratory. The, the full name is Google Collaboratory, Collaborate plus Laboratory, Google Colab, right? So I'm going to click on this and I'm going to get started. So right about now, you should be seeing something like this on your screen. So just go ahead and new notebook. Click on new notebook to get started. Okay. So um, if you are not doing this, you are also free to just relax and watch and observe. In fact, I would advise you to do that more than you know going ahead to um um code along with us because this should be a relaxed session for you. You know, as somebody that is just getting their feet wet with Python programming, right? So you can relax and later on you can now go ahead and move on and you know watch the recordings again and um watch the recordings again and now practice right so one thing i want to do is i i, I don't like this um theme let me just guide and select the light theme um particularly due to, due to the fact that you know i'm presenting to people right uh, i'm i i don't necessarily be a dark person uh, maybe in my personal work but presents to everybody let's use a much much light-hearted theme right so now we are in google collab the environment where we write our code Right. Let me go ahead and test run a few things. Let me see whether I can zoom in. Oh, let me see whether I can zoom in. Is I I trying to zoom in, but it doesn't seem to work. Hopefully, this font size should be enough for everybody. Okay. Um, we are good to go. So now let's go ahead and start session, or let's go ahead and look at what we are going to be discussing in today's session. Right. Now, in this particular practical session, which I'm going to come up here and name, I'll call my notebook practical session. Right practical session so in this practical session that we are going to be um going through what are we going to be doing now when you're writing this kind of programs you always want to you know start with that overall goal or overall objective mentality right so what are we trying to do here okay so basically we're trying to explore some simple concepts right so we're just trying to explore some simple concepts right and we are trying to use those concepts in to simulate a real world or uh, um, um, application. So use those use concepts to simulate real world applications. Right. So this is like the overall idea of what we are going to be using this notebook for. Explore some simple concepts then use those concepts to simulate reward application, right? So I could go ahead and just, you know, list out the concepts we are going to be exploring. Okay, so to get started, we are going to be looking at um, comments, basically. We're going to be looking at comments. Now, you can see the way I'm writing now. You can see that I'm putting 
if I write like this, if I, if I address increment like this, look how different it is. So we're going to um discuss why that is so. Okay, comments, no? We're going to look at data types, right? We are going to look at variables. Variables, right? And we are going to be looking at rules or behind variables, right? So that will be along when we look when we look at the um, variables, when we understand what variables are, we are also going to um, look at the rules in um, when handling variables. Okay, we are going to move on to conditional formatting or condition conditionals. Basically, we are going to look at conditionals, conditionals, right? I'm going to look at conditionals, right? What are what are conditionals in Python programming, right? And after that, we are going to look at functions. That's the last thing we look at, functions. Okay, functions. And by the time we are done with this, we would have probably been halfway through um our real world app, and then we are just going to guide and you know apply the above concepts. So let me just say apply the above concepts, you know, to our real world um app. Okay. So that's it's that is basically the overall objective of what we are doing, right? Like I'm I'm starting to run this cell. I'm running this cell, right? But there's nothing here to run, it's just comments. So I'm entering the first thing that we're discussing for today, comments. There is nothing to run in this cell. So um because this cell contains comments. Okay, so that's the first thing we are going to discuss, comments. But before we go ahead and discuss comments, I can just go ahead and show you, give you a bit of um showcase on what other things we could do with collab. Right. So you could also give it headings. You could come up here and you could just say, this is my um, introduction objectives. Basically, I could just come up here and write that here and say, this is my objectives. Right. This is my objectives. And look at how it's, you know, it looks like a text editor. But like I said earlier on, it's a special text editor, different from what you are probably used to when writing documents and, you know, um, uh, using MS Word or using um, Google Docs. Okay, so let's begin now. Let's get into comments. So what are comments? What are comments? Now, you see all these lines that I'm writing over here. You see all these things that I'm putting here, these symbols over here, right? These symbols are how we write comments. Now, have you ever read a book or a document and, you know, you are reading a line, let's say they say something about um, a historical figure, let's say Mr. A, did so 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 and so right? Did so 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 and so. Let me just say so 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 and so here, right? Did so 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 and so. And then you see an asterisk, right? After that sentence, the asterisk is usually up, right? It's usually you know like um up above the um sentence um or basically up of the sentence, right? <laughs> For the lack of better words, you see an asterisk like this. And then that asterisk, you know, when you're reading that book, maybe it can be a textbook, it can be you know maybe, um a literature text. And if, if you see that asterisk, you go down. And you see that there's something written, you know, to reflect that asterisk, right? There's something written to reflect that asterisk. Now, um, it do, now that is like a, what comments are, right? That, that that's like what comments are in programming. So sometimes when we write Python code, so let me write my first Python code. This is my first Python code. Print statement. My first Python code. When I write a Python code and I say print, um, Ibrahim. My name is Ibrahim. So go ahead and print Ibrahim. When I write my first Python code, right, print Ibrahim. Sometimes I might want to explain what the code does. I might want to explain what the code does. And that's what comments are. Comments are means by which we use, by which we document, you know, our thought process when creating um, Python programs. So I will come up here and I will say, this is my first Python code, a print statement. My first Python code, a print statement statements right so these are exactly what um comments are um descript um documentations basically within your code to help you understand better trust me have you have you ever experienced a situation where you know you you are working on a project right you're working on something right and then you leave it for like a long time and then you come back and you are completely lost right you are completely lost sometimes that is due to um, the fact that you may not have probably properly documented what you were doing when you left it, or uh, that's due to time, right? You know, you are coming back, you are getting disconnected with what you got disconnected from what you were doing. It's the same thing with um, programming too. Sometimes we leave codes for a while and come back to it. Sometimes we need to share codes to other people. These comments are how we document what our thought process were when we were writing this code. Okay, if I come back to this next year now and I see this line of code, I know that oh. This was my first Python code, and this is a print statement. Okay, 
Right. So that is um what comments are basically. The same way um humans receive and store information, you know, uh okay, that's exactly what comments are basically, right? They are similar to explanations, but you can write comments anywhere to explain your code and document what you are doing. Okay, so we're going to be using comments over the course of the um when you are exploring the other concepts to basically just document and explain what exactly is going on in each cell, right? So cell, what's the cell? All these are cells, these are cells, this is a cell, this is a cell here. If I go down here, see, I click on code, this is another cell, so this is another cell, right? So this is another cell, right? If I go down here and I click on this, this is a third cell. So these are cells, these are what cells are, right? They are the um, boxes in Colab where you write your code on, right? Code, code boxes, cells, whatever you choose to call them. Okay, so let's move on. Um, now we are going to be looking at um data types, right? We are going to be keep starting things off with data. We are going to be continuing with data types, I mean. So now, how would I explain data type to a beginner? So what is data type? How would I explain data type to a beginner? Okay, so let me go ahead and ask uh, a couple of us. Um, and you can you, you feel probably uh, you feel um feel free to you know send the response in the chat. If I were to ask any of us here, let's say I'm asking everybody now, um, I don't know how to make a bar. Um, that's the analogy I'm using. I don't know how to make a bar, right? And I'm not asking everybody, how would you present the information to me? How would you tell me? How would you communicate? I'm, I'm, I'm posting a competition where I'm saying that, look, I want to um, I want to make a bar. I need somebody to document the process of making a bar to me, right? And send that information to me and send that data to me, right? So what format would you use? Um, would you prefer to type it out? As you know, um, or a as you know, a document, or do you prefer to use images, right? You just use image one, somebody pouring water, image two, somebody adding, you know, Gary, and so image three, somebody turning it. So, what would be your particular preference, you know, when, when how to how to do video? Yes, lovely. How to do video? Okay. Yeah. So that is one way um you can do this. Um. Yeah. So video exactly video uh, uh information through videos now. What you are doing basically is you, you, are, you, you are sending information to me through various formats. You are sending information to me through various formats, right? You are sending information to me through various formats. Now, the same way you are doing that is the same way it com I can do that to a computer. I can explicitly instruct a computer to carry out certain actions through data types, right? But now, it's not as you know, straightforward as that, right? But more or less the same thing because I can tell a computer, okay, add one plus one. One is data and the other one is data. Add one to two. This is data and this is data too. So I'm instructing a computer. In order to instruct a computer, you need to be able to present information or data to the computer basically. Or if, if in order to instruct or, or write Python programs, your program also needs to handle data basically. Now, this is how, this is, this is what data types are basically. A data types is the various formats that your program that Python is comfortably the, the various formats that of data that Python is you know comfortably in handling. Right. So let's go ahead and look at you know the data types we'll be picking in this class. Now that's limited scope, just the data types we'll be picking in this class. Right. There are a lot of data types, but we are going to look at just the ones we'll be picking in this class. The popular ones, the ones that no programmer out there is not aware of. Okay, so let's go ahead and list them out. We'll be taking integers. Right, integers. We are also going to be taking floats and we'll be taking strings. So, integer, float, strings. These are the three data types that we will be taking. Okay, so let's start off with integers, right? Let's start off with integers. Like integers, if you are familiar you know, with that terminology, you know what it means, right? Integers, numbers, integers, numbers, right? Somebody could have told me when they are communicating to me on how to make the delicacy I said earlier on, you probably you know have some integers, right? Being um, being communicated to me, use two cups of water, use three hands, three hands, um, hands you know, boil water for 20 minutes, right? Integers, numbers. So integers are basically numbers without decimal points. That is the um that is what I want you to understand about that word integers. Integers, these are numbers without decimals or decimal points. Okay, integers, numbers without decimal points. Okay, so that's what an integer is. So let me go ahead and you know, drop some examples of, of integers right here on 
two. One example is 10. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and write some numbers out here. 20. These are all integers, numbers, right? See how Python is, you know, returning the number back to us. You could say print the number 20. Print, return, write the number 20 on the screen. That's what print means. Write the number 20 on the screen. Write the number 10 on the screen. Let me go ahead and comment that. Comment that too. Write 10 on screen. Okay? So write the number 10 on my screen. Right? So that is it over here. Print 10. Now, you see that you can feed that um, information to Python, the number itself that you are printing. You can feed it and it will be Python will be comfortably comfortable in handling that information and doing what you want it to do. Yeah, Python so Python so print. Python is asking, what do you want me to print? What type of what information do you want me to print? Number. You say 10. Python says, okay, I can handle this. I can actually print out the number on screen. So Python is uh, comfortable in its handling numbers. So what else is Python comfortably comfortable in handling, right? Python is also comfortable, comfortable in handling floats, floats, this floats. So I'm going to ask the question now. I'm going to ask a question now, right? And I need engagement, okay? Or oh, somebody's already seen it in the chat, but I've seen it engagement. If you are not yet, use, if you are not yet, type in the chat and let yourself be known, right? So if, if integers, yes, I'm still here, okay? If integers, this happened because it's a new account, so um, that, that, that is bound to happen if it's a new account you just set up, which I just did here for this particular demonstration. So my question is this, if integers are numbers without decimals, who can tell me what floats are? So I'll repeat myself again, and that's an opportunity to say in the class. If integers are numbers without decimal points, what are floats, right? So Asha says floats are numbers with decimal points. Exactly, floats are numbers with decimal points, right? So the, the question might be coming in, why do I need to have uh, why would Python, why can't Python just have one um or umbrella for both of them? Why can't Python just say numbers? Why can't Python just say numbers? Right now, that is because you know different different problems require different solutions sometimes. And for this particular case, um, how you how you store a number and how you store a float is different, especially within your computer itself, right? So a float could be something like ten point one 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 one. This is a float, right? This is a float. 10.11111. If I go ahead and print it out, Python can handle this, right? Now, in, to optimize for space, Python, the way Python will store this is different from the way Python will store this in some cases, right? So that is why um, there are two types of number data types, integers and floats. There are more than two types, but these are the two types we are looking at, integers and floats. Okay, so before I move on, I want to show something, right? We have, we, we've said there are two types of data, that we have, there are, um, we've looked at two types of data types or we'll look at two data types, right? How do we know what data type we are dealing with when we are always on, 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 on coding, right? So how, how can I know this is an integer? How can I know this is a float? I know this question seems naive because you can just look at it, right? But you know, not, it is not always in every case you can always look at your data to know whether it's an integer or a float. So how can we know, right? How can we get Python to, to check what um, data type we are currently handling? Right, we use the word type, we use the command type. The command type is how we do that. For the sake of this class, I'm not going to be, you know, I'll just use type to confirm that this is an integer and this is a float, and let's see what Python returns. So when I tell Python, give me the data type for num the number 10, this is what Python returns. Python returns an integer, INT. Python says this type here is INT. INT stands for what? Integer. INT stands for integer. INT stands for integer, right? So this is Python telling you what this data type is. So meaning that Python itself has the ability to look at you know the data you are supplying it and tell you the type. Now the other one that we did, right? Let's go ahead and check out this uh the second one, right? Which is for floats. So when I say type and I pass in 10, let's say 0.5 in this particular in this particular case, stick look at what it brings out for me. It brings out floats. So basically integer floats is INT. Loot. Right. So let's go to the third data type we'll be discussing in today's class. The third data type we'll be discussing in today's class. We've discussed integers, we've discussed floats. Floats are what? Numbers. Numbers with decimal points. Right. Numbers with decimal points. Okay. Now let's go ahead and let's look at the third data type. Okay. So, um, let, let, let me let me go ahead and 
throw out a sentence to you, or let me go ahead and let me go ahead and throw out um information to everybody on the chat. Right? Let me say this now. At eight today, you came to this class with um nine point five um battery percent. Right? At eight today, you came to this class with nine point five battery percent. Now I am sure we can all spot the integer and the um float in that my sentence at eight today you came to class with 9.5 battery percent. I just came up with it on the spot, right? So I'm sure everyone here can spot the integer and the float. So you can go ahead and tell me what the integer is in that sentence I just said, and the float is. If we're passing that sentence to people, passing that to Python, what would probably be the integer and the float in that particular case? You can go ahead and say it um, in the chat. What am I trying to drive at? The information that I just communicated to everybody, the information I just communicated to everybody, right? I used an integer, I use the float. What other data type do you suspect I use? If eight is integer, nine point five is float. What other data type do you suggest I use? Right now, remove those two. Remove those two um uh, data types. The integer. Remove it. Remove the um float. You remove the integers and remove the float. The integer is eight. The float is nine point five. Remove the integer. Remove the float. What else is left in my sentence? At dash today, I came to class with dash percent. What do you think that now the remaining part of your sentence, the remaining part of your sentence, right, is what we call a string. And so we're able to, in this particular example, me communicating information to you, I was able to combine an integer, a float, and text characters, basically, um, string, a paragraph, basically, which in Python, in Python terms, we call a string. I was able to um, add a string to my integer and my float and communicate information to you. So that's the last data type we're going to be using because you know it's almost incomplete. Information is almost incomplete if we don't have, if we don't have these three data types to communicate with. You know, so that is what we call a string, right? A string. So a string basically are just text data types. Strings are just text data types. Are just text data types, right? Nothing more, nothing less. Do not make it too fancy definition. Just very something very simple. Strings are text data types. And if you observe, you know, when I said print Ibrahim, what do you think I was doing? What it says you... when I said print Ibrahim, um, I, I'm getting um response from the chat that my network is I can't be heard. Um, please um can a confirmation be made that I can be heard properly? Can a confirmation be um, made in the chat that I can that I can be heard properly? Exactly. So yeah. it's my fault. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me move on. Okay. So print Ibrahim. Now, I've already given you guys, I've already foreshadowed the discussion of strings in our conversation by using this first example. Our first Python code is what? Me saying, me telling Python to write and write on my screen a string. This is what a string is. Text information. Information cannot, you cannot communicate all information in the world through numbers, integers, and floats. Integers, floats, and strings is much, much, a much, much, you have a much, much better chance of communicating information, right? So, this is what a string is, and this is how, you know, you write a string, which is very, very important. Let's break it down. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to, you know, break down how we write a string for us. We start with what? With this. Now, because I'm using an IDE, because I'm using an IDE. Okay, I'll do it again. I'll do it again. This, this is what I press. So I press shift and you know um, apostrophe, but it gave me the two apostrophe. In most ID, in most um, if it was in Word document, it would just give you only one. I give you only one um, apostrophe. But in this case, see, it gave you both the beginning and the ending apostrophe, right? So this is what this is why ID is intelligent. But let me go ahead and cancel one out. So this is how you write a string. You start with your opening apostrophe, whatever text you want to write inside. Whatever text you want to write inside, whatever information you want Python to treat as a text, this is this part is very very important to understand. Whatever information you want Python to treat as a text, you write inside your apostrophes. So I'm going to write my name inside here, and then I'm going to put in my closing apostrophe. I'll go over that again. You start with opening apostrophe, but let me make it. Let me do that as a comment. Let me do that as a comment. Opening apostrophe, right? Opening apostrophe, I put APS. Then you put in your information, basically, as you know, your information that you want to write, and you put what your closing apostrophe, your closing apostrophe. Okay, 
So this is how you, you know, write a string in Python. This is how you go about writing a string in Python. And see, Python returns it back to me that this is what, is, what, this is what you ran in this cell. But a much, much, you know, better and formal way to do it would have been print, print Ibrahim, print Ibrahim. Okay, so I'll go ahead and do that, print Ibrahim. So opening apostrophe. Now I I just wanted opening apostrophe, but Python recognizes um, but Colab recognizes that Python doesn't just deal with apostrophe in ones. It is it deals with apostrophes in pairs, in twos. So what to do is just bring both of them for me at the same time. This is the importance of ID using ID to code. This is the importance. I don't have to manually type the opening apostrophe and closing apostrophe. Once I do, once I just go ahead and press this um shift apostrophe. It will bring both of them for me and put my um cursor in the center of both apostrophes so I can start typing seamlessly. This is what an IDE does. This is the this is the integrated part of the IDE talking. This is the integrated part of the IDE working. The inner workings of you know collab is getting this thing done for us, you know, automatically, right? So print Ibrahim. And here we go. You see it's written loud and clear here, Ibrahim. Okay, so this is what a text is, right? Now I've looked at what we've looked at. We looked at um strings, we looked at um integers, we looked at float. Now, let's go ahead and you know discuss this or the, the next concept, which is variables, which is variables. Okay, so to discuss variables or to start kick start the conversation with, around variables, I'm going to ask a couple of I'm going to ask a um, question to everybody right here with us, right? So let me go ahead and ask if I was to ask everyone here for their name, right? If I was to ask everyone here for their name. Almost the class will, will not have a problem recalling their name, right? If I ask you what is your name, you just go ahead and tell me what your name, what your name is. For example, I can see Matthew is here. If I ask Matthew what is your name, Matthew won't have any problem just you know recalling his name and telling it to me, right? Similarly, if I were to ask a couple of you, you guys now, how much is left in your bank account? Now, somebody was saying what their name is in the chat. If I was to ask you how much how much is left in your bank account, right? About right now, since your last debit or credit transaction, how much is left in your bank account, right? What you will do is that you will mentally retrieve that, that data from your head, right? You will recall, you will recall the last time you saw a debit or credit transaction, and you know, you will record the amount you saw in the alert, and then you will come back and tell me, right? That is if you want to tell me, right? Basically, so what you are doing is this, is this you you store information in your brain at a particular point in time in your life, right? And when I came back to meet you and I asked you, okay, um, you give you give me that information, you retrieved it. Now, similarly. Similarly, a program, a Python program can store information like that. A Python program can store information like that. Now, your bank account is variable to change. Your bank account changes all the time, right? So anytime I come back to ask you, I'm certain that it's not the amount that you see the last time, that's the amount you see the next time, right? More, more importantly, when it changes, you yourself, you have to manually update it in your head. You can probably say, my account today was $20, $20, 20 billion and tomorrow, when I saw that ten billion dollars coming, my account is now worth thirty billion dollars. So you yourself, you have to, you know, if you, you yourself, you are aware of the fact that it is a variable, you know, uh, on, on number. It is not a, it is a variable number. So basically, this is how your brain might uh, might work it out. Your brain might say, my balance is what? My balance is ten. Let me put this. Let me ensure that I'm putting the right number of zeros here. Uh, ten thousand. This thousand. Ten thousand. Hundred thousand. A million, ten million. So my yeah, the, the, the my balance is ten million. Balance equals to ten million. Your brain will probably do something like this, similar to what is happening here. And this is how Python works. This is how Python brain, the Python's own brain works, right? In saving variables. This is how you save it with Python. Balance equals to what ten million. Okay. So you can if you cannot come back here now. Now, this is the this is the beauty of this. This is the variable. This is the variable name. The same way I can ask you what is your name. And you say my name is what Samuel, right? And the same way I can ask you what is your balance. You say my balance is what a thousand. Meaning you have variable name, variable name that is appropriate for the conversation, right? Variable name that is appropriate for what you are doing in real life. I can when I ask what is your name, name in that in that context is like your variable name, right? The variable name, right? What is your name? And I say ah, my name is so so and so. My name is Matthew. My name is Samuel, right? So variable name equals to the actual value. The actual value. This is how you you know specify a variable in Python program. In real life, all you have to do is tell the kid, "This is your name." Memorize it and use it for the rest of your life. And the kid would assign it in his head. In Python program, this is how we tell a bouncing baby Python program how to um store a name into any name or any other variables, right? 
the variable name you want to store and the actual value, right? So let's go ahead and, you know, then just to show you what, what I'm talking about here, battery percent could be another variable name, battery percent, right? Be a variable name and you will store it as what? 9.5. Right, nine point five percent. Right, you could have another variable name age, and you store it as what twenty years old. So these are this is this is me now. Variable name, actual value. Observe the actual value of all these variable names. The first is what is a string. The second is what is an integer. Right. The third is what a float. The last the last one is what another integer. So these are all variable um variable values, right? And these are all the forms variable values can take. I am many more, but these are the ones within the context of this class we are going to be discussing. Okay, so now let's go. Now I can now you can now later on, same way in life, you can later on reference your name after you have been given it and you have memorized it. It's the same way in Python programs too. You can now later on reference that particular variable, variable name to get the actual value, right? I can now say, okay, at a particular point in my program, I saved my balance. I saved the balance. With the balance, I saved it as what variable name again. I would say I saved it as balance, right? So I'll now come here and say, okay, I want to now see my balance on my screen. I will now say print what? Print balance. I won't say print this amount here. I'll say print balance, right? And this is what will happen. Print. Python will say he wants to print something. Python will say, what does he want to print? Python will look at this. Okay, this is a variable name. Python will now go and fetch the variable value. And in, in the place of this variable name, it will, it will put the value here and execute that statement. Print one print 10 million okay print 10 million right so right about now right about now we have looked at variables right this is variables storing information within your programming context right now let's go ahead and look at some rules about variables some rules about variables these are very very important rules and for this particular part of the conversation i will be making mistakes i will be making mistakes on purpose for this particular part of the conversation so I will be breaking the rules to demonstrate the rules to you, right? They say rules are meant to be broken. In programming, rules are not meant to be broken. But for the sake of this class, I am going to be breaking rules, right? So let's go ahead with um, um rules about variables. This is the next thing we're going to be talking about. Let me just go ahead and demonstrate my headings all over again and say this is rules about variables okay rules about variables how i did this was i used the text the text box instead of the code box okay so rules about variables rule number one variables are case sensitive case sensitive balance with a small letter c b is not the same thing is not the same thing as balance with a capital letter b let me put this as a comment they are not the same they are not they are, they are not the same is not the same Okay, so see the difference. I want you to observe the difference between both of them. Look at the difference. The first letter for both of them is the difference, right? They are not the same thing. Please, they are not the same thing. Almost all the time, Python to do in, in, in for variables, Python, you know, does not equate, you know, capital letter to small letter. It doesn't do it like that, right? Balance with a small letter B is different from balance with capital letter B. Let's go ahead and break this rule. Let's go ahead and break this rule. So I specify that I want balance to be equal to 10 uh, million error. So that's one, two, three, one, two, three, right? And then I come over here and I say that, let me print what, let me go ahead and print balance. Let's see what happens when I, when I make that mistake, when I break that rule, look at what it tells me, name error, balance is not defined. The variable that you are trying to call, we don't have it anywhere in our system. We have not been told what balance the capital letter B is. But we do know what balance the small letter B is. That means that this is Python talking. We do know what balance the small letter B is, but balance the capital letter B, we haven't seen that at all. This is not something that we have seen at all. Okay, so to correct this, obviously, you need to you know ensure that your case sensitivity is um, up to par. Okay, see now, we have corrected this. Okay, so that is what, that is the first rule, case sensitive. Now, another rule again is that, you know, variables cannot start with numbers, variables cannot start with numbers. Variables cannot start with numbers. This is another rule that we should all know. Variables cannot start with numbers. Let me go ahead and uh, um, um, let me go ahead and then break the rule again, like I said. So, for example, the analytics have what? The analytics have over um have trained over um a million 
um, students. The analytics have trained over a million students, right? The analytics have trained over a million students. So I want to see that word million. I make the mistake of saying, let me say it as 10 analytics, 10 underscore A L Y T I C S, 10 underscore students. Let me put it like that, right? We have a million students in our training programs, right? Now I save it as 10 million. Okay. One, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, let me go ahead and remove this. Right. So I want to save my variable, the number of students we have in our training programs, 10 million. I want to save it as what? As analytic students. This makes sense to me. This, this, this is the variable that should make sense now because it describes what I'm trying to save. The number of students we have in our programs, the analytic students, 10 million. Right. So, but if I run it, watch what happens. I get an error. I get an error. That is because variables cannot start with numbers. Variables cannot start with numbers. Variables cannot start with numbers. So what do I go ahead and do? I can go ahead and you know, be more creative about it and say this is probably a better way to save it, right? Okay. And then I can now go ahead and get this out. Right. So now, right about now, watch, everything looks good to go. And I can just come back here and reference the previously stored variable value, right? Ensure that your spelling is always correct when working with variable. Ensure your spelling is always correct when working with variable. Okay, so this is it now. Um, I have just referenced a previously stored um variable, right? And this time around, I have correctly used the right naming convention. Okay, that is another rule. We've broken the rule, we've rectified it. Let's go, let's break another rule again. Okay, so another rule I want us to break this time around is one that I intentionally avoided the last time. I intentionally avoided breaking it the last time, but I'm going to break it now on purpose. Let's come back here. Let's come back here. When I said example of variables, I said battery percent. I said battery underscore percent. Look at this. I said battery underscore percent. I'm talking about battery percent, right? Why can't I come here and say what? Or let me use another example. Let me say account balance. Why can't I come here and say account balance, right? And then save it as this, as 10, 1, 2, 3, 1. 10 million. Why can't I save it like this? Why can't I just write account space balance equals to 10 million and run it and see what happens? It doesn't work like that. Spaces, spaces, spaces gives, spaces is nightmare for Python, basically. It's a nightmare for Python to handle most of the time, especially outside the context of a string. Spaces is a nightmare to handle. You need to know how to, spaces, tabs, they are nightmares for Python programs to handle. They are not in the context of a string, right? So this is another, another rule that I am breaking right about now, which is that, the rule is that there are no spaces, right? There are no spaces between words when you are naming a variable. Don't use spaces between words. Don't use spaces between words when naming a variable. When naming a variable. Okay, don't use spaces between words when naming a variable. Let's look at these comments. Let's say I eliminate all this. Let's say I, I eliminate all the spaces in my comments that I just wrote just now. Let's say I eliminate all the spaces in my comments that I wrote just now. Is this still readable? Is this, can we still read this? Yes, you can still read this. You know, no, if you cannot read this in the chat. I want to know whether this is still readable. I want to know. Now, I've said that we cannot use spaces when naming variables, right? I want to know, is this still readable despite, you know, us not having spaces here for this particular comment? Okay, faith says yes. Anybody have fun? Is anybody else struggling to see read what this means? Is anybody else struggling to read what this sentence says? I can read it clearly, but that's maybe particularly because I wrote it right. But you see that the readability is not lost on us. The readability of this comment is not lost on us. Don't you can see you can see basically see it's right about here. Don't use spaces between words when naming variables, right? You can observe that every new every new word in this sentence starts with the capital letter. So that is one way we can correct this. That is one popular way in Python programming to correct this rule, to correct or breaking this rule. We can come up here and say what? Account, right? And start with a B, and start with a B here, yeah. the capital letter B and say balance, right? Account, and start with the capital letter B and say balance, right? This is one way you can go ahead and name this. I'll come up here and say account balance, right? See. Readability is still maintained. Readability is still maintained, right? To, to an extent. And you can now go ahead and say 10 million. Okay, so this is account balance, right? And look at me correcting the error. Don't use spaces between words when naming a variable, right? So see, 
invalid syntax when you use a space, but when you come over here and you use what you call camel keys, camel keys, when you use what is called camel keys, right? Camel, camel keys, right? You know, the, camel, the camel goes like this, you know, the, the back of the camel goes like this, right? So this is a, this is similar to that, it comes up here, goes back down, comes up here again, right? Camel keys, right? This is how, you know, you can go about that. Another way you can go about that is instead of using camel keys, let's say you don't like capitalizing and you know, writing small letters, you can write in all small letters if that's your preference, and you simply say account. Instead of space, you can go ahead and say underscore balance account underscore balance, and you go ahead and write your value over here, and it will still run seamlessly. So, camel case is one way you can go about writing a variable name with multiple words. Another way you can go about it is using underscore. Use underscores instead. Right. Another way to go about this is using what underscores underscores okay so that is um an, a, a second way now let me make an intentional mistake here let me see i go ahead and say account instead of using underscore i didn't press my shift i say minus balance so i didn't press shift minus i pressed um just minus like that right and i say equals to this amount i want you to observe this i want you to observe this this would not run this would not run it is imperative that you know how to name your variables using the appropriate conventions, and you are also aware of potential pitfalls, so that when you are debugging, right, you're, when you are debugging your program, because you are aware of a certain type of error that might exist when naming your variables, you might, you know, check whether that is the error that is causing your program to break. So this is an error, a potential error you can be on the lookout for. See, the error here is that instead of writing underscore, I wrote a minus, which is on the same key here on my keyboard. Right, so this is a this is this will be done an error. That's because the minus itself is 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 interpreted as something else in Python. Okay, so this is not allowed. Account underscore balance or camel case is capital letter A, capital letter B, everything else small letters. Okay, okay. Right about now, we've looked at um variables and how to what how to you know write variable names, right? How to assign variable names to your values. Okay. So right about now, let's go ahead and write multiple lines of code. Let's go ahead and write multiple lines of code. We have just been writing single lines of code. Let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and write multiple lines of code, right? Because, you know, we are building towards, you know, creating something that will simulate real life. So we can, you know, start um, starting with that. We can start with that from um, this part of the code. So writing, writing multiple lines of code. Okay, so now, the, the 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 example I'm going to use in this case is with regarding the balance, right? Let's say um you don't want to put it in your head, you just want to have a program that will track um account balance when a debit alert comes in, when a credit alert comes in to update your account balance for you. That is what we want to do in this particular line of program. So we want to state what our balance is, we want to save it as a variable, we want to um add two more variables, right? That will denote your credit and debit amounts. Right, and then we want to calculate what your new balance would be. So that's exactly what we want to do in this line, this multiple lines of code here. So we start with balance. Okay, okay. Also again, um, 10, 10 million, let me 10 million. Okay, so this is the balance, right? Next up, credit. This is the amount that entered. We know what credit means. Uh, I don't think anyone here has never received a credit tran transaction before. But if you haven't, let me know. I'll be I'll, I'll be your first credit credit alert um ever. If you haven't ever received a credit alert at all, I'll be the first credit alert ever. Right. So credit is equal to what? Now what entered? Let's say five entered. So five, one, two, three, one, two, three. Right. So um balance is ten, credit is five. Now debit. Now even, even if you have never received a credit alert before, I know for a fact that everybody has has received a debit alert. Every but debit alert is not a is not a uh, uh, um what's the word I mean is 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 no is is a friend to nobody <laughs> exactly debit alert is a friend to nobody even though you have not received from anywhere else your your bank itself would have given your debit alert too everyone that has the debit alert so debit uh, debit now is now what let's get and say in this particular context debit is what um ten one two three one two three yeah we spent a lot that day so um balance is ten million credit is what five million. Right, and debit is the debit amount is what 10 million also, right? So 10, 5, 10. Okay, 
that's this that so basically i'm building um this is my these are multiple lines of code that is building towards the situation we have the balance we have the credit and debit alert for that day now what is the new balance what is the new balance who can tell me how i would calculate the new balance who can tell me how i will calculate the new balance who can go ahead and tell me how i will calculate the new balance anybody here just go ahead and tell me what and what I will do. I, what do we do to credit? What do we do to debit? How do they affect our overall balance? People, can you go ahead and let me know? Help me out here. Or I will start calling out names of people. Just type it in the chat if you know you are an accountant like me. Or how do we go about you know calculating um new balance right from the old balance? Exactly. You, Asha is getting there. Asha has given us attempts number one. Asha has given us step number one. Who else is um after something else to add? Who else has something else to add? Okay. So see, he's saying, hmm, I, I wonder what that hmm might be. Okay. <laughs> so let me move on. So Asha has given us step number one. We add credits, right? So if we add credits, what do we do to debit? We remove debit. So we start from there. We say balance plus. Okay. Oh, I'm typing it here. Pardon me. Uh, I'll come over and I'll say um, balance. Now, I'm going to intentionally make a mistake. Plus credits minus debit we can see the mistake i intentionally made we can thank you uh Olua Femi. thank you iphone whoever is iphone i'll say thank you thanks a lot too for the assist okay so balance exactly asha is, asha is on point today asha, asha took today today's class is serious right so let's look at this again i intentionally made a mistake here and we can see the mistake i made the, mi the mistake i made is this the mistake i made is this balance should be in lower cases i love this class a lot you guys are on point here with me balance should be in lower case exactly so you see that if if i was in a hurry i was just clicking i was just typing away i would have run this and i would have seen an error what is the error i'll come back what do i see here balance is not defined ah i will look at this properly i'll recall that oh balance is in lower case and from what we see we discussed in class we know that um Python does Python do differentiate between uppercase and lowercase. I will come back here, and this is what I'm doing. It's called debugging, but we won't go into that. And I will change it from a small letter, capital letter B, small letter B, and I will run this. I will run this, right? When I run this, would I will I have what new balance? I will come over here and I will print new, not issue new balance, so not issue new balance. Our balance in our account, new balance. Okay, I will now have new balance here, and see my new balance five m. 5 million, right? So 5 million. So you see that I've written, written multiple lines of code to simulate something that happens in everyday life. Something that happens in everyday life. When the credit alert comes in, there's a program that takes your current balance and the value of the credit and adds it up together and you know replaces it back as your balance, right? There's a there's a program that does that in real life, right? So this is a, this is a simulation of how that works. Okay, so now. Let's start. Let's start. Um. Let's let's start looking at some. Or um. I'm talking about real life, right? Let's start looking at some variation of this problem in real life also. Now, let's say you receive what you receive twenty thousand. Let's say you receive um, twenty different transactions in one day. You add twenty different transactions in one day. Ten credits, ten debits, right? You add it in one day, right? So how would you go about writing this multiple lines of code? We, we can we, we can copy all this over here. We we'll say Ctrl we'll C. We we'll come down here. We we'll paste it here. We we'll need to adjust this. This is now what five. It's now what five. We need to adjust this. Calculate again. Then when we, when we do for that, that's case one. We'll, case two again. Last one. Let's say the time around there was no credits, just only debit. We we'll put zero here, just only debit. We we'll calculate again. All right. We we'll move on to the next case and so on. So we are going to be copying and pasting our code a couple of times, right? Each time, whenever a new transaction comes in, just to rerun the code again. Now this is too much work. This is too much work, and this is not how it's done in real life because this is absurd. It's absurd to do it like this in real life. That for every account out there, we, uh, for every transaction out there, we need to re re create create this um uh, this variables uh, manually exactly create the variables manually right and you know no it's not that's not how it's done in real in in the real world right in the real world there are ways we can um avoid what is called hard coding so we are hard coding these variables. Hard coding these variables. These variables, these numbers are meant to be dynamic. These numbers are meant to be dynamic, right? They're not meant to be um in, in our own code. We're not meant to be writing it inside of, of our code, right? Because this code will be applied to millions of um accounts. Each account have their own balance. Each account, each transaction is very different from the other transactions 
in terms of the credit and debit um, values, right? Because of these differences, we cannot add the add coding number like numbers like this. We cannot be putting writing it manually like this. You understand? We can't be doing that. We need to create something that is dynamic, something that can take in new inputs at all times, something that you, you can you can instruct it. This is the balance. This was the credit. This was the debit. Now the, and that program will now itself calculate the new balance. You see what I'm doing with this, right? What we are doing so far is we are typing the output manually in our code base. What I want to do is I want our code base to react to us. I want our code base to ask us what is the balance, and we type in the balance. Then the code base, code base will ask us what is the credit value, what is the debit value. Okay, so to do that, to do that, we are going to discuss something called input. Input. Input is how we do that. We are going to discuss something called input. We are going to discuss how we can use input, the input command, the input command alongside the float, float command, right, for less hard coding. So I said earlier on that this thing that we do here, where we take actual values and write, is called hard coding. And it is a red flag. It's a red flag in programming, right? In programming, hard coding is a red flag. Let me put it like that. Hard coding is a red flag in programming, right? We don't want to be writing the actual values in our code. Hard coding is a red flag, right? The only reason we do this here is because I'm trying to demonstrate other earlier concepts. But now that we've understood that concept, we need to now know that we cannot, in our own code, be manually typing in numbers. We have to, you know, figure out a way uh, that, you know, to type in variables instead or manually uh, assign these variable values itself, right? Or, or sorry, dynamically assign these variable values itself. Right, so let's go ahead with um, how we can use input and float for less hard coding. How we can use input and float for less hard coding. So the first thing I want us to do in this multiple lines of code that we wrote here is what? Get the balance, right? Get the balance. So we're going to use input to get the balance, right? We'll start off by saying input. We'll start off by saying balance is equal to. Now we'll start off by saying balance is equal to. In the position of writing a number like we usually do, instead of writing a number like we usually do, we are going to now tell Python input what is your current balance? I will go ahead and explain what's going on here. What is your current balance? Observe this. I want you to observe this when I run this. I want you to observe when I run this, right? What is your current balance? Let me let me add a bit of um of contraction so that you know they don't think that we don't know how to use synthesis adequately. Right. So look at this now. Look at this now. We've gone from manually typing values out to creating a situation where Python can now taking different values and make calculation for different situations. What is your current balance? It is now a question asked to the user and the user will provide that, right? I'll go ahead and say one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And it, it is stored because when I come here and say balance, when I come here and say print balance, when I come here and say print balance, right? This information has now been stored in a variable called what? Balance. So when I come here and say print balance, look at what happened. Let me reiterate again. Let me reiterate. Input is a way for Python to ask the users for input. It's as simple as that. You see that? It's as simple as that. Input is a way for Python. The input command is a way for Python to ask users for their inputs, right? Python also wants your opinion in some cases, right? When it is running its program, give me your current balance in this particular case. Give me your current balance. So input is how that is done. Now, when you give Python your input, Python needs to save it somewhere. And we have discussed it in, like, like in, in the previous concept. How do we save information? We save information in variables. We use variable names to save the actual values of, you know, uh, or to save information, right? So this, in, this the result of this, of, of Python asking for your input, right? The information it gives to Python, Python will save it as balanced. The same thing we did for here, just replace the numbers now with an opportunity for Python to ask the user for their input. So Python asks you for your input, what is your current balance, and saves it to balance over here. So I will run this again. I will run this again, right? This time around, I'm going to put what? I'm going to put 34. 34, 1, 2, 3. OK? And I'm going to print out balance. See, 34,000. So many, what this means is that this, this program can now run for different cases. You can run for somebody who has an account balance of 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. You can run for multiple, all variations of account balance that exist. You can now run this program for that because you have figured out a way to ensure that for every case that, for every case, for, every, for each and every one of these cases, 
right? You can dynamically ask them for their inputs, for their balance. You don't have to come here and start copying all the code and pasting it again and running everything. No, it's input ensures that ad coding is becomes non-existent in your code, right? So let's go ahead and simulate this completely, okay? But before we do that, let's go back and do something. Let me show you something else again. I'm going to run this one last time. This time around, I'll put a space here, right? What is your current balance? We, we see it's um, 10, um, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, right? So I'm running this. Now, observe that first, it's, it, 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 because it's a string, it's just going to put it here for me. But when I come down here and say, what is the type of variable that we now have here? What is the type of variable you think comes out from here? It is not what you think. It is not what you think. The variable type is not a integer. The variable type is not an integer. Not just because you are typing in number when Python asks you for an input doesn't mean that the variable that gets saved as a result of that operation is a number. I kid you not, you are going to be alarmed at the fact that the variable type for balance is a string. Is a string. And why is that so? Because if I come here and I run this, I come here around this. What is your current balance? This input, right, permits me to write Ibrahim. It also permits me to write Ibrahim. Permits me to write Ibrahim. And if I come here and I see um, print Ibrahim down here, let me cancel this. If I come here and say print Ibrahim down here, if I come here and say print Ibrahim down here, you see that, so, oh, pardon me, print balance, print balance down here, right? You would see that it is Ibrahim that is here. That's because you know the user was malicious. The user was malicious when they asked him what is the point balance and typed in a string. So this input, what it does is that whatever you give it to me, it will convert it to a string. It will convert it to a string to ensure that it's always going to be a string. Whatever I give it to, whatever I give it, it's going to put it's going to convert it to a string. How do you convert to a string again? Right? You just do like this, right? It's, so that's what Python is doing. Whatever I give it, it will put it between these two apostrophe. It will put it between these two apostrophe and save it as a variable. So it is not an integer. For, and it's, for it to be an integer, you have to what, remove these two apostrophe manually. For it to convert an integer to a string, you add apostrophe. For it to remove, for it to convert string back to integer, you remove apostrophe. Ma now this is manually to convert manually from string to integer. To convert within Python programming, how you would do it is you would use the type, the data type you want to convert it back to. So for example, to con let me do manually again for you. To convert um, this is a, this is a thousand in string format. To convert to an integer, you remove this right. This is how you do it manually, right? But let me show you how you would have done it using using um what's it called using python's um language you the right int the data type you want to convert it to so you see why i was showing you the data types as we were explaining the data type you want to convert it to you put it like that and then you come over here and you you wrap it around it you tell python i know that this thing is a string i know me yes i know it's a string but i want it as an integer do that for me and python will say okay you just you know the thing that you, the, what we're doing when we're removing okay i need to stop running this okay what we're doing when we were when we're removing those apostrophes python will do it if it can do it if it can do it and you will get 1000 okay so that is how you convert from a string to an integer and let's come back and apply that here but in this particular case i want to convert to a float not to an integer I want, because balances can be like this balances can be 1099 10.99 10 point nine nine this could be a balance also right so i want to convert to a float not to an integer so i'll come over here and i would say float and i'll pass this in and i'll pass this in now we are talking now we have what is your current balance i can see my current balance is on 10 1 2 3 1 2 3 and i put that here and i come over here and i ask what okay what is not the variable type and you tell me it is a float it is a float okay so now we see that we are getting somewhere. We have now we are now able to dynamically ask our users for their account balance, right? What is next? What are we going to ask for them next? We are going to ask them for the debit amount, how much is about to leave their account, how much is about to come in, and then we're now going to go ahead and calculate the new balance. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we go. So I'm just going to control C this, control V, control V, and okay. So instead of balance here, it will be credit, and we will ask the user, we would ask the user. How much is about to leave? How much is about to enter your account? All 
right? How much is about the entire account? That is what you gave it to. That is um, what the question I'll be asked to get the credit variable. To get the debit variable, right? We'll simply come over here and we'll say how much is about to leave your account, right? Leave your account. So the user provides all this information for us. And what do we do? We cannot go ahead and run this last line. So you basically see that these lines of code that I did here, all I simply did was replace this first three with a way for Python to ask users the question and to get information back and put that information as a float. Now I cannot come here and say new balance. I will just copy this, right? New balance is equal to, so again, not issue, is equal to um, balance plus credit minus debit. And we can now run this. Let's say today uh, I started off with what? 10, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. What, nothing entered my account today, so I will just put zero over here. But something left my account. Let's say 10, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Okay. And now if, they, if you go ahead and print new balance, go ahead and print new balance, right? You will see that the amount is what is zero. Now, one more thing that I, I didn't mention initially, right? Is when you are writing codes on um Google Colab, let's say code like new balance. When you're writing it, how do you run it? How do you run your code, right? I've just been doing that without discussing it with you guys. How do you run your code, right? You there's a play button here that you click on. This play button here, you click on it, you see that it is rolling. It means that your code is running and then your code is run. That is one way to um run your lines of code. Another way is to press shift and enter, shift and enter. When you press shift and enter, you also run your line of code in that same similar manner. Okay, so that is um uh, writing multiple lines of code that ask for user input, right? So right about now, we have three other concepts to discuss before we call it a close. Three other concepts to discuss before we call it a close. We have the conditionals. We are going to talk about conditionals, right? Conditionals. We are also going to talk about what? I'm going to talk about um, um functions. And we're going to apply both of them together, conditionals and functions, right? I'm going to apply both of them together, conditionals and functions. Okay, right. So, okay, so conditionals, functions, and then we we'll apply them together. I'm just going to and put that one, put that one out of the way. So, conditionals and functions. Let's say two more concepts to go. Okay, two more concepts to go. Right. What are conditionals? Let's go. Let's come back up okay, here to our example. Let me run this again. Today's a today's a brand new day. I woke up my account. I woke up with zero nera. I spent a lot yesterday. I woke up with zero nera. That's my current balance, right? But me, I'm trying to be malicious. I'm trying to be sneaky. I come over here, not sitting on my account, but I'm trying to spend. I'm trying to spend money that is not in my account. I come by and I put 10, 8,000 era. It will run. It will run, which is bad. It will run because we don't operate on a credit economy. We don't operate on a credit system. We don't have um my this this account basically is not a credit account. It's not an account that can go into minus. But the balance will show us minus a thousand. This is headache. This is headache for us. This is headache for us because these are these are these are savings accounts that the minimum is zero. But it got to zero, and because of we did not prove, we, we did not understood some concepts, it got to zero, and it's still continued removing from zero to get to minus, minus a thousand. Something that you know is not part of how the account should run, or how the account should operate. We are not having unexpected behavior because we did not understand some concepts. The concept we do not understand is what we call conditionals. It's already in that word condition, condition, condition. Remove money from his account on the condition that the money is there to be removed. Remove money from his account on the condition that the money is there to be removed. That's how it will be in the real world. If I'm if I was talking to a cashier, this is that's what I tell the cashier. You don't remove a thousand from an account that has zero. You only remove when on the condition that there is money in that account. Remove the debit amount if the amount is in the account. I'm using that word if because that's what we are going to next. If so, I've come that's how I, I would communicate to the cashier. I'll tell the cashier, do a if b is true, right? Do a do do remove money from his account, which is a if the money is actually there, if he can afford you know that if he has more that, that money or more in his account, that is B. Do A if B is true. Mm -hmm. In similar lights too, that's how Python works. Python can be your humble cashier in this, in this, in this example also, right? Python can say, um, Python, Python, in Python's case, it will be, if A is true, if A is true, Python will not say what, do B. Just follow me. These are not lines, these are not actual codes. These are just comments, right? If A is true, do B. 
or do a uh, a one. Let me put a one. Let me put a one. Let me put a one. If a is true or do one, yes, do one. If a is true, do one. If a is not true or if a is not true, do do step two instead. If a is not true, push this guy from our bank. Push him from our bank, please. If he doesn't have enough money in his account and he's trying to debit some amount, that's what I'll tell the cashier. Right? Chase me away, please. You should go away. We need people that have money in our accounts, in our in our bank branches, right? So that is um um the second part of conditionals. Okay. So if A is true, do number one. If A is not true, do number two. If he has that amount that he's trying to debit in his account, debit it. Calculate new balance. Else. Print insufficient transactions, insufficient funds. That's how we come. That's how we, that's how we are communicated to ATM, right? If you go to an ATM and you put in your eight, your your eight, your ATM card and you type in an amount that is not there, what happens? You see miss the message insufficient funds. You see the message insufficient funds. That is part of an if an if statement. That's part of a conditional, a condition that's been you know placed in that um, um ATM's program. You know that's how the ATM is, has been conditioned to run. Check the the amount in this guy's card. If it's enough, go ahead and do it. If it's not enough, then it be sufficient for that spit his card out back or swallow the card. Let's take inside the back and start fighting us. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yes, but that is how conditional works. In real life, we, we, we express this in every day. We are part of an ecosystem that uses conditionals in programs every day without even realizing it. So let's go ahead and see how we communicate that in Python, right? The proper way to communicate that in Python. It is similar to what is here, but not exactly here. So let's go ahead and write it out in, in, in the appropriate manner. It is if a condition is true. So we we'll say if we're not going to put the condition. In our case, the condition is the condition is what? The condition is if new balance is greater than, let me go ahead and say new balance. Now, what is greater than sign? I'm, I don't know what greater, greater than sign is. I'm not going to put greater than for, for now, greater than. But then this is not the actual sign. We are going to explain what's greater than, what the greater than sign is. Why am I misspelling greater than like this? We are going to explain what the greater than sign is now. But let me go ahead and put greater than J instead as a placeholder. If new balance greater than um debit, um then sorry, if balance greater than debit, if balance greater than debit, if the amount you're trying to remove from the overall account, right? If it's um actually J, if it's adequate enough, right? Go ahead and do it. Calculate new balance to be equals to new balance should not be equals to what balance um minus debit. So let's go ahead and look at greater than now. Let's get a look at this greater than. This is not the way to write it, but what is the way to write it? Anybody here can tell me what you feel like the way to write it is? Does anybody here have an idea what, how would write greater than in Python? Does anybody here have an idea how would write greater than in Python? Okay, Asha has come again with it. Anybody else has a different um, way? There are two ways to write greater than, greater than and greater than and equal to. Anyone else you know, can tell me how to go about writing greater than and equal to? I understand if you don't know. I understand if you don't know. That's why we are here. That is why we are here. Let me go ahead and explain it to you. I can say if balance equal to, I would have started by saying if balance equal to debit, do this. But we know now, and it's work, right? Because if the balance is always equal to the amount you want to remove from the account, right? This transaction should go. It should go, right? Except there's extra charges, right? It should work, right? But now I'm also saying that, I'm also saying that it's not, this is just one way. The other way is that if the balance is more than the debit amount you want to remove, more than the debit amount you want to remove, also do this. Also go ahead and remove it, right? So if the balance is either equal to the debit amount or the balance is more than the debit amount. So if the balance is equal to or greater than the debit amount, go ahead and run your transaction. So this is how we do it. Now this is for equal to. For greater than or equal to, you do it like this. The way you learn inequalities in mathematics, if you learn inequalities, the sign is, this sign here, your angular bracket, your angular bracket, that's the sign equal to. Go ahead and run this. Okay? Go ahead and run this. Now, this is if balance greater or equal to debit. New balance is equal to balance minus debit. This is how you run your conditionals. There are a lot of other conditionals. Now, greater than, this is for greater than or equal to. Greater than or equal to, right? This is how you run this. Greater than or equal to. Now, for less than or equal to, less than or equal to, this is the opposite, opposite, opposite um, from situation, right? You do it like this, less than, the other way, to look at it points the other way, right, and equal to, okay? Less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. There's just normal, it's equal to themselves, right? Just equal to, without the less or, or greater than 
you just go ahead and do this, right? And is lastly, there is not equal to, right? Not equal to. And this is where I will stop. This is where I will stop in, in this. So this is not equal to, right? Not equal to. Okay. So this is all the conditionals, all the conditionals. That this is how we compare things. You are comparing one thing to the other thing, right? So in this case, we are comparing each balance greater than or equal to debit alert, right? Debit amount. Go ahead and calculate the new balance. Go ahead and run the transaction. Otherwise, else, if, else, I, I will tell my cashier, otherwise, for shoot them from the bank, right? <laughs> otherwise, or, or if it's the ATM, I'll say the ATM, swallow his card. If you see he wants to claim that he's wise. So else, you print insufficient bond. You print insufficient bond, right? Okay, you print insufficient funds, right? So this is how we run this. Let's go ahead and simulate a bit. Let me come here and say balance is um, balance is equal to. Let, let me hard code for a while. Balance is ten, debit is um twenty, right? Now this will not work. Let me go ahead and run it and let's see whether it works. See insufficient funds. It balance was saved as ten, debit was saved as twenty. It asks the question: If balance greater than says that no, ten is not greater than twenty. Else, print insufficient funds. Let's go ahead and you know. Um, do the other the other one where it's actually you know enough. I'll say new balance here. Okay, so I'll come over here again and I'll say balance now is now what thirty. Okay, so we should get ten printed out because we are printing new balance, which is what um thirty minus twenty. Okay, so that is conditionals basically. We cannot take that and have it as part of our multiple lines of code that we are running as part of our multiple lines of code that we are running. Okay, so I'm going to come over here. And I'm going to um, I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to take these multiple lines of code here, take these multiple lines of code here that I have created before that works well, and I'm going to add our conditionals to it. Let's go ahead and you know get that in here, place it here. Now, where are we going to add our conditionals? Right about here. We're going to add our conditionals right about here. We are going to just start by saying, if this time around I'll use less than, I'll use less than this time around. If new balance, if sorry, if balance is less than um the debit amount, if balance is less than the debit amount, if this person is trying to be wise, if this person is trying to be wise, right? Go ahead and print, go ahead and print insufficient funds, insufficient funds, right? We always handle debit ahead of credit in our place of work. We always handle the debit first. Otherwise, else. Else, else, we we'll come over here and we we'll see this. Okay, so that is how it would work. That is how it's going to work, right? If balance is less than the debit, because we always handle debit before we handle credit, right? So if balance is less than debit, insufficient funds, right? Then new balance is equal to this. Okay, so now that we have that point, we can now come over here and run this again. I'll come over here and run this again. And this is just using conditionals. I'll start with 10. I'll start with 10. Then I'll come over here and I'll say 20. How much is about to enter your account? Now, here's the thing. I'll say 20. But because we always handle debit before credit, what is handle debit before credit? Watch what is going to happen when I say uh, what is about to leave. 20 is about to leave. Now, this should work because 20 is entry, 20 is leaving. So it should work. But I'll say that we are always going to handle debit. We are prioritizing debit over credit in this particular case. Right? So watch that to see your insufficient form. So how you program your code should reflect how you want it to run in real life. How you program your code should reflect how you want it to run in real life. Okay, pardon me. I want to um, switch to my secondary power. Batches will give me 20 seconds. 20 seconds to switch to a secondary power source. Okay, um, um, pardon me, it seems like um, I would have to continue on this and end the lecture here with everybody, okay? So let me just go ahead and write the last part of the function. Okay, so the last thing we're going to be talking about is function, 
function, right? The last one we're talking about is function. Now, all this code that we have written, all this code that we have written over here, all this code that we have written over here, we are going to be taking it to different places in ATM machines, in um, bank apps, everywhere. We're going to be taking all this from all these all these things that we're written. We want to package it. We want to package it so that it will be easy to run all these places. So how we are going to do that is we are going to say def, which is I want to define a function. I want to define a function. Then you come and say the function out. The function name is transaction. The function name is transaction, right? And then I will take all this here. I will take all this here, copy it, and I will paste it in here. Copy it, and I will paste it in here, right? Copy it, and I will paste it in here. And then when I'm done with that, you will see that this line of code that we are running like this, we cannot be referencing it at every other part of our, of our program because we have created a function. A function is a, an algorithm that you know, takes all the steps and put them together all in one place for your program to be able to reference. So I'll go ahead and run this now. And when I come down here, and when I come down here and say, and say um, transaction, transaction, we can see that the code now runs. The code now runs. When I say transaction, right, DEF, I pass in DEF here, and I say transaction. We can see that the code now runs, right? So, the code now runs, okay? So, something seems to be happening here that is not supposed to be happening. Okay. Um. Okay, so this is a function, and this is how a function you know, would run in most cases, right? So DEF, define your define your function name, transaction, and you know this, the lines of code that we have written, pass it under your building block, and then go ahead and um run your transaction reference. Okay, this is all time would that time would um permit, right? But this is the last. Okay, now it is running, right? Okay, so you can go ahead and write your values, write your values write your values and see your full amount, right? See your full amount. Okay, now I will run it again, I will run it again. See, it is now referencing the building blocks, the lines of code that I have. Okay, so um, I would love to end it here to um, end it here and pass the baton back to uh, my um, lovely um, colleague, Damilola. Okay, Damilola. Hi, Ibrahim. Wow, that's an, that was an amazing session. Can we give Ibrahim a, a round of applause? Thank you so much for that, for that session. Okay. Um, thank you, Ibrahim, once again. Thank you for... Um, and I can see a lot of comments saying that they learned a lot. And I'm really glad that you guys um, got a lot from that session. Like I said earlier, it was going to be a session where you get to learn uh, really amazing and new stuff. So well done. Thank you again, Ibrahim. All right. So we'll just um, very quickly take the last part of the session before we call it an amazing day. Okay. Now you've seen the this in just one hour you've seen what you were able to learn with Ibrahim. Now imagine what you'll be able to learn in one hour plus so much more, right? So let me take you through how you can get started um, in the data engineering program. Please confirm you can see my screen. Um, Ibrahim, can you confirm you can see my screen? Um, yes, I can. Can you All hear right. me? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I can. Okay. All right. So, who is a data scientist? This is somebody that applies advanced analytics, statistics, and machine learning techniques to derive meaningful insights and build predictive models. Basically, the little that you've done now, as you know, sort of like pushed or propelled you into, into a data science career, right? Because you've just done a little bit of 
python basically coding with python and then at some point you start to use python to do descriptive analytics predictive analytics diagnostic analytics what you just did what, what the little that we just did now is one over one thousand of what you can do with python like it's just the basic stuff okay so a data scientist is somebody who applies advanced analytics um statistics and machine learning techniques to derive meaningful um insights and build predictive models and as a data scientist um your key learning areas will be statistics forecasting and predictive analytics using microsoft excel that's like we have a you know we said i said earlier that our courses are structured in a way that are beginner friendly and emphasis on structured right because you're not just going from one place to the other learning from everywhere you're learning from a very structured a program that's been working for a lot of people so you're going to be learning statistics you'll be learning forecasting and predictive analytics using microsoft excel you'll be learning tablet for analytics as well as um sql structured query language which is a language for databases you learn in-depth python modeling python programming what we've done today like i said is one over one thousand of what you can do with python and you're going to be learning that in the course of the program you learn exploratory data analysis you learn um machine learning right machine learning techniques and um models how to build machine learning models you learn computer vision GTOP version control right chat gpt and github copilot for coding as well as microsoft fabrics for analytics these are the things i'm going to be learning in the data science program so much there's so much that's been packed into this one program to ensure that you get maximum value for your money optimal value for your money and then the learning timeline for data science program is four months. Four months. That's three months of intensive live classes and learning. And then one month of internship. Three months of intensive learning, one month of internship. Another thing to note is that classes are on weekends. Okay. So we've, you know, tell us it in a way that you don't have to um you know, take classes on work this when you're working, you're doing this and that. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is on weekends come to classes, specifically on Saturdays, right? On Monday in the morning, eleven a.m. to two p.m. And this gets us to West African time. And this gets us to people in the UK, in the US, in the U in the UK, in um Europe, in Africa. Then we have the evening session, which gets us to people in in um. Canada and US. And this is from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. West African time, which is also 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And then on Sundays, you get something that we call the self-paced Watch Me Do It videos. And these are videos that have been put together to explain concepts to you. So that when you come to classes, your life classes on Saturdays, you're working on real life case studies. We work with real life case studies. We work based, you know, focus solely on real life case studies where you're doing things that would, you know, prepare you for what you meet in the real world. Okay. So classes on weekends, on Saturdays, and on Sundays. On Saturdays, you have your live classes where you're going to be working on real life case studies. And then on Sunday, you have your self paced watch midweek videos. Okay. Now, this is. Just like I read out, this is like the total um, breakdown of the full stack data science program. Like I said, you'll be learning um, statistics. Then you move to Microsoft Excel. You learn statistics using, um, you know, everything that's to do with statistics, mean, median, mode, variance, covariance. Very simple. I feel like the one we teach here is much more simpler than what most of us learned in school. Okay. And um, you learn Microsoft Excel, how to build interactive dashboards using Microsoft Excel, and also predictive analytics in Microsoft Excel. Then also learn predictive analytics using Tableau. Okay, you learn SQL. Like I said, it's a um, database language. It helps you to draw out information from your database. Your database is like your um, data warehouse. Then you learn Python programming, which allows you to which half of all we've done okay then you then um data analytics and visualization machine learning computer vision and any um 
natural language processing. If you go on a LinkedIn on LinkedIn and you type in hashtag analytics, you see a couple of um computer vision projects that majority of our students have done and they posted, and you see how they're able to you know use technology to work for their for their own um self. Okay. So 50% to help you land a job. This program are covered basically on weekends. Now, why should you train with analytics? Why should you choose us as your learning partner? Number one, we have phenomenal achievements helping people get jobs. If you go on LinkedIn again and you type in, tap, tap in hashtag analytics, you see a lot of people, a lot of testimonials about how we have helped people to land jobs. If you go on YouTube, you go on a YouTube channel, you would see a lot of testimonials talking about oh, Tenalytics helping to land job, landing my job after taking my program with Tenalytics, and so on and so forth. So we have helped over two thousand plus people transition from the classroom into their first job in tech across Canada, Africa, Asia, UK, Europe, and so on and so forth. We have a track record, and we do not, you know, speak by mouth everything is on the internet all you need to go is just go to our instagram page or go to our youtube channel to see a lot of testimonials and you know people talking about how we've helped them to land their their new role then we have uh we work with industry standard facilitators and curriculum our curriculum very structured very straightforward very, very beginner friendly you don't have to have any background in tech before you can get started in any of our programs. That's how you know intentional we've been about helping people learn, you know, transition into tech and making it very seamless. Emphasis on seamless. So we have the up to, the most up to date curriculum and the best trainers. The be look at Ibrahim. A lot of people saying they enjoy his class and all of that, and that's just one out of hundreds of facilities that we have that are trade trainers that know their own use okay so we um we work with the best trainers in the industry with experience in fortune 500 companies then we have um, a blended training approach to accommodate every learning type okay it's a combination of live classes and watch me do videos so that you're able to learn regardless of where you are regardless of what you're doing regardless of your um your background basically so with combination of both live classes and watch me do it videos um we're able to bring up to speed fast and slow learners and they can easily just learn with no barrier and no pressure number four we have tailored sessions to position you to land your first job we have designed power packed strategies to help you to land your first job in tech Okay, that's going from CV review to LinkedIn optimization to Upwork optimization to interview preparation sessions and so much more. So these are the reasons why you should choose us as your learning partner. These are the reasons why you should choose us as your learning partner. But wait, there is more. How can you position yourself for success in a job market in a three-layered approach? These are things that will also dive deeply into in the course of the program how you can position yourself for success in the job market in a three-layered approach level one is the cv review sessions some people they are you know applying for jobs every day 10 jobs but they're not doing it correctly it's is that it's you know it's, it's a lot of um we're sorry we're sorry we're sorry we're gonna teach you how to, to tailor your cv to specific roles, to the roles that you're applying for. Some people have a one size fit all CV. That's not the way it should be. Some people, they have their, their date of birth on their CV. That's wrong, okay? And so this is how we're going to teach you in the course of these CV review sessions. would we'll give you templates that will work well for you, templates that have worked for people and will also work for you. So we have the CV review sessions. We've got a LinkedIn optimization. LinkedIn is a place that, it's a it's a job marketplace okay it's a place that people go to get jobs all right and a lot of people do not know this because they don't even know how to start to get started with linkedin they don't know how to go you know to just dive into that market we will teach you how to optimize your linkedin 
to ensure that it's well optimized enough that it's attractive to recruiters. Then we have upwork up optimization. This is for people that do not have any interest whatsoever in working for other people. You want to be a boss of your own, or you even want to, you want to do upwork as side also, right? We teach how to optimize upwork in a way that you're able to get gigs and jobs directly from upwork. For example, students in the UK that are limited to twenty hours of work. 20 hours of work, and then that's not enough for you, or you need something on the side. We we'll teach you how to optimize work work so that you're able to start landing your gigs and also ending in different currencies. Then we have the navigating the job market sessions. These are sessions that will teach you how to navigate the job market so that you're able to, you know, blend in and get your job as soon as possible. We have um the job and interview preparation sessions. We'll do demo sessions and at any point in time, even after you finished your program, if you get a, an interview invite and you reach out to us at analytics, we'll prepare you for the interview. Okay, so that's one major um thing that you have as long as you have taken any of the analytics program. Then we've got recommendation and reference letter. This is for people that um, you've gotten a job, you need a reference, would write you reference letter, write your recommendation letter, ref recommendation letters for visa applications, and so on and so forth. These are things that we we'll do for you as additional um employability services. Uh, we have the weekly mentorship session, which is right under the level two, right? The level two weekly mentorship sessions. These are sessions that will bring in experts. The last um for last Thursday, we had two recruiters come in to speak to our students on how they should position themselves. You know, you, you are getting like direct tips from recruiters, people that are constantly recruiting people, okay? So that's a lot of things you get then from the mentorship session. Then you also get the on-the-job supports. We promise that if you've gotten your job and for like the first two months, you need assistance, we'll definitely um, get you on-the-job support. Then the level three is um I promise to you, which is a guaranteed job interview one month after completing your training with us. Okay, so these are the new additional um initiatives that we have added to the to our program this year. Talking about the body mentorship session, where we bring in we bring in people that have um gone through the program and then the succeeded, they've landed a job, they are working perfectly, they'll come and teach you what exactly they did and how you can also go about your So Alumni that have gotten jobs in a chosen career path will serve as your support system. You have access to these people to ask them questions, to reach out to them for help, what have you. Okay, so the mentorship session is designed to um have, you know, a lot of people that have gone through the program aspire inspire you to also take the steps that it took to be able to learn their job then we have the enhanced internship experience where you get to do two months of i mean yet you get to do a lot of um projects during your internship then we have the partnership recruitment agencies in the uk canada us and other countries and um this partnership is focused on recommending our participants as potential candidates for various roles that they are recruiting for all right so see some of our success stories we're not just like i said we're not just going to be um talking and it's no matter of we're just talking we're not doing what we're seeing we do best we talk and we do okay so look at um some of our success stories we have any who took this same data science program right and he got a job as a ceo of a tech company right after his program after he finished his program with analytics he started in october he landed in october 2023 he landed his role in january 2024 right he completed his program in january 2024 and he started working as a ceo of the company that he's currently working with and also he is a body mentor that we're going to be bringing on board a lot to help you um transition perfectly we've got nathaniel who took our business analysis program and um he also got a job as a data engineer he joined data engineering program as well and got a job as a business analyst so 
it's sort of like interwoven and you're able to land your jobs regardless of uh, you're able to land your jobs perfectly with no asshole okay we've got a lot of success stories here i can always check out right after we send the class materials to you so please try to fill the form that we've been sending because this is where you'd be getting your your life your materials from the class all right so a lot of success stories a lot of them this is abigail used to work as a care worker but she got a job as a business analyst the same thing for biola he joined the data analytics program and was able to land a, a role as a financial in a financial giant company in the uk um meet ikmat ikmat you know took a break from work she wanted to cater for her kids and all that and then she was a full-time stay-at-home mom for like a very long time then she took advantage of this same scholarship that we're currently offering and now she works as a data analyst with nhs with full uk visa sponsorship okay so there's so there's so many testimonials that you can read upon on our social media platforms all right um okay so more success stories more success stories more success stories now there's this particular you know i said earlier that we have something fantastic in store for you so what is that uh, we currently are running the International Women's Day Scholarship for the entire month of March, where you get to join any of our programs and pay 50% of the fee. 50%. We're taking 50% off, and so you're going to be paying 50%. For example, if we were charging 1 million for data science, you get to pay 500,000. That's a whole 500,000 of the training fee, but it's not 1 million, all right? So we currently are running this grant for the first 300 women and 50 women, so 50 men to register. And please note that as of today, we have about 200 of the slots gone. So if you're going to be taking advantage of this, you want to take it as soon as possible because you never know how many people are going to be paying today, how many people are going to be paying tomorrow, if you procrastinate, they say that procrastination is the enemy of something, something, something. I don't know what it is, but I hope you get what I mean. So the earlier you do this, the better. Now, these are programs, um, all right? But for the data science program, you get to pay, um, the full amount is $750. But due to the fact that we're running the International Women's Day Scholarship, you get to pay $375 dollars only only and let me quickly okay um can you see my screen what's gonna be all right okay so let's not confuse people Okay, yeah, that looks better. Okay. Uh. Why am I doing that? <laughs> All right, so please come make and see my screen. Hi, right, Brian, can you go from and see my screen? Okay, okay. All right, thank you. So for the data science program, um, the, the full amount in dollars is $750. In pounds, it's $625. Pounds. Instead of paying $750, half off, you get to pay $375. In pounds, it's $625. Pounds. Instead of $625, pounds, you get to pay $313. Pounds. In Canadian dollars, it's $10.50. 10, um, Canadian dollars, but you get to pay 525 Canadian dollars. In Naira, it's 900,000, but you get to pay 450,000. So if you're going to be paying for the data science program, uh, my colleague is going to be dropping the link in the chat, okay? All you have to do is click on the link to register. You click on the link to 
register. Okay, so remember, it's for the first 300 women and 50 men. Once we've hit this mark, it's gone. Okay, the the discount is over, and every other person reverts back to the main fee. All right, so and the course is going to be starting 6th of April. <clears throat> 6th of April 2024. So the earlier you take advantage of this scholarship, the better. All right. Um okay, so join our next course starting 6th of April. Click on the link that my colleague has sent to register. Very important. You go you get to pay the, the, the 50% fee. Okay. So um this are more testimonials, more testimonials more testimonials all right like i said you can always go on uh, any of our youtube channel instagram channel to um watch any of these testimonials as a matter of fact i think i'm just gonna play um one of the testimonials so that we can see <clears throat> life and direct okay let me play the one from All right, so if my year, uh, just give me a minute. I'm trying to set that up. I'm trying to bring that up. Okay, um, almost there. Okay. As it marks, and um, I was with the match court in Ten Analytics, and joining Ten Analytics has been the best decision so far. You know, for me, someone coming from a background of full housewife, because I had to stay back home to look after my child for four years, and then wanting to break into something new, wanting to go back into work into the workforce, you know, wanting to place myself in the society for better job opportunities so it was a lot and then i'm glad that analytics came along and then they presented me with so many opportunities right in front of me better opportunities and then i'm glad i took it and then <clears throat> uh also the advice of do not sell yourself short that if he is obviously it is very very valid because Place yourself right, you know, don't sell yourself short. It's a very, very, very valid advice. You know, in analytics, they will hold your hands like a child, you know, through through the models. You have to you have the opportunity to go back and study. You have the opportunity to go back and practice. You have the opportunity to ask questions. You know, we have people you can always go back to even outside of class, class hours. It's, it's the most amazing experience so far, really. And then Another thing is the interview prep, guys. That is another very important thing. I did my interview prep with Mr. Mohammed, and it's the best decision ever because it was like he saw into the future. He knew what was going to be asked. And I'm glad that I took, I wrote down all the things he mentioned. I went back to practice. And then when it was time for the interview, it was like everything he was mentioning, everything he mentioned, it was just, they kept on. And then when I was answering those questions, I was so confident, you know, because I already practiced. I did an Excel test, I did a math test, and then they were really impressed. And another thing is, guys, it may not come as fast as you expect. Definitely, you are going to get some no's, and then you may begin to think you're not good enough. You are good enough, yes. The no's will come, but always take it as a basis for learning and development, because after every interview where I got a no, I always make sure I get a personal feedback. So I work on those feedback. For my next interviews and yes it worked it really worked for me because i got my first job three months into the program my first job i couldn't take up the job because i was still there was a student and i was only eligible to go to work 20 hours so i couldn't take up the job three months later i got two jobs with full visa sponsorship and guys all the other no's before the two jobs prepared me for the yeses i got so yes the no's will come but do not give up because you always have analytics to go back to. They are the best 
best and the best thing that ever happened to me and then yes um and they are the uh, most affordable the most affordable one i've come across so far mm. that's a very good advantage so yes the analytics for the win <laughs> All right, so you've heard directly from ICMAS and there's more where that came from. But we're not going to bore you with all that. We're just going to let you go and select. Just go on YouTube and tap on any of this, any of the testimonials there. But yes, that's um, that's the bulk of it. And right now we're going to be closing the session. Okay, so I wonder if we have any questions. Um, any questions? If anybody has any questions for us before we call it a very fantastic day. But yes, um, our achievements to date, we have helped about 2,000 people transition from the classroom into their first job in tech um, across different um, countries. And we have participants working in different, you know, countries across different companies. Sterling Bank, eBay, United Capital, Total, Amazon. It goes on and on and on. We have been featured in a lot of um a lot of um newsletters, newspapers, blogs, and so on and so forth. So <laughs> um yes. This is Again, we currently have the 50% discount running. So if you want to take advantage of that, that is um something that you definitely want to, to do as soon as possible. So yes. Do we have any questions for us before we call it a, a day? If you have questions, you like to ask questions, if you can use the reason icon and we'll call you. Okay, in the absence of none, we are going to be having more sessions coming up. We also are going to be having our clarity session, which would love for you to attend to ask your personal questions. If you feel like you don't want to answer your questions, you want to ask your questions there, which is very valid. So we have the um clarity sessions would we'll let you know when this will be coming up. And then we we'll definitely love to see you guys in class. So thank you very much to everybody that has, you know, made it to this time. I do hope to see you guys in class, same as Ibrahim. Enjoy the rest of your day, your night, your evening. Bye, everyone.